All right, so today we're diving into a topic that you, the listeners, suggested. And honestly, it's one that really hits home for a lot of people, um, dysthymia. Yeah. And to help us unpack this, we're taking a look at Dr. K's video, How Dysthymia Steals Your Happiness, over on YouTube. Yeah, it's a really insightful video. I have to say, right from the start, Dr. K does a great job of kind of setting the stage and explaining how dysthymia is different from, you know, what we typically think of as depression. Because it's not just about the blues, right? Right, exactly. He uses this term uh, episodic to describe typical depression. Yeah. You know, those periods of intense sadness that come and go, often triggered by, you know, life events or circumstances. But dysthymia, it's more like this constant low-grade sadness, this chronic state of being where joy it just feels kind of drained even when things on the surface seem okay it's like having this sort of i don't know like a, a gray filter over your experiences even the good ones that's a great way to put it it's like this subtle but ever-present weight that kind of prevents you from fully experiencing joy or contentment so it's less about what's happening to you and more about how you're experiencing everything. Exactly. And one of the things that Dr. K highlights that I found really interesting is that people with dysthymia are often high achievers. You know, they might have successful careers, seemingly fulfilling lives, but internally, they're still struggling. It's almost like they're living proof that success and happiness aren't always one and the same. Absolutely. And it really underscores just how complex and nuanced this condition can be. So if it's not just external circumstances driving this, what's going on beneath the surface? Well, Dr. K introduces this concept of the dominant other. The dominant other. Yeah. Basically, he's talking about this pattern that often starts in childhood where a person's sense of self-worth becomes entirely dependent on external validation. So instead of feeling good about themselves because they inherently are good, it's all about seeking approval from someone or something else. Exactly. And this dominant other, it could be apparent societal expectations, even a specific situation, but it becomes the primary source of validation. Okay, I'm really curious to unpack this dominant other idea a bit more. How does that actually play out, you know, in real life? Well, Dr. K gives this example. Picture a child who studies really hard, gets a nearly perfect grade on a test, but instead of being praised, you know, for all that effort, they're met with disappointment because it wasn't the highest score. Oh, wow. That's that's got to sting, even at a young age. Right. And what happens is that the child internalizes this message, that their worth is conditional on meeting these external standards, these expectations set by someone else. So it's not even necessarily about being like overtly critical. Yeah. It's just this subtle shift in focus from internal validation to external validation. Exactly. And, you know, it can manifest in ways you might not expect. Like Dr. K also talks about situations where the dominant other isn't even a demanding figure. Oh, really? Yeah. Like he gives the example of a child growing up with a chronically ill parent. And how does that tie into the dominant other dynamic? Well, in this case, the child might learn to equate their parents' well-being, whether it's emotional or physical, with their own actions. So they start to feel this immense responsibility for their parents' happiness. Exactly. And while that sense of responsibility can come from a place of love and care, it can also become a burden, you know, because every good deed, every act of service is all filtered through this lens of, am I doing enough to make my parent happy? And in a way, it's almost like their own happiness becomes secondary. Right. And that's where this pattern of seeking external validation can really take root. You know, it's like their internal compass for joy. It gets recalibrate it to always point outwards instead of inwards. And when your happiness depends so much on something outside of yourself, it's got to be like exhausting trying to constantly earn those external validation points. Absolutely. And what ends up happening is that the internal reward system, that natural sense of accomplishment and joy, it kind of gets, I don't know, short circuited. So even when they achieve something amazing, it's like that inner, heck yeah, I did it feeling just doesn't land the same way. Yeah, it's like they're going through the motions of living, doing all the right things, but that deep sense of satisfaction just isn't there. And Dr. K, he actually uses this really interesting analogy. Give me with it. He compares it to eating food that looks delicious. Mm -hmm. You know, it smells great, should be enjoyable, but no matter what you do, it always tastes kind of bland. Like you can appreciate that it should be good, but you're not actually getting any of the pleasure from it. Exactly. And that's where things can get really tricky because when those internal reward circuits aren't firing properly, you know, naturally people start to look for those good feelings, that dopamine hit, elsewhere. It's like the classic dopamine trap, right? We see it with social media, with substances, even with things like workaholism. Yeah. It's all about 
chasing that external validation, that sense of reward that's missing internally. Exactly. And this is where Dr. K points out this pattern he's observed in his patients that I found really fascinating. Okay, lay it on me. He's noticed that people with dysthymia are often drawn to, you know, what you might call the melancholy aspects of life. Melancholy. Like what? Give me some examples. Well, you know, think like existential literature, dark humor, music or art that deals with themes of isolation or longing, that kind of thing. Oh, wow. Now that you mention it, that totally tracks. It's like they're drawn to these external reflections of their own internal landscape. Exactly. Because it validates their experience, right? To see those same emotions, those same struggles reflected back at them in art, in music, in literature, it's like a way of feeling less alone in their experience. So with all of this in mind, this deep-rooted pattern of seeking external validation, this difficulty experiencing pleasure. How does someone even begin to break free? It sounds like a monumental task. It is. It definitely can be. And, you know, when it comes to treatment, Dr. K actually offers a word of caution here. Oh, what's that? Well, he explains that while traditional methods like therapy or medication can be incredibly helpful for a lot of people, for those with dysthymia, they might not address the root of the issue. So it's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken bone. It might cover up the problem temporarily, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually fix the underlying issue. Exactly. And he's not saying that those treatments are ineffective by any means, but he emphasizes the importance of working with a mental health professional who really understands the nuances of dysthymia. Because it's not just about alleviating the symptoms. It's about addressing those underlying patterns, those thought processes. Absolutely. It's about rewiring those neural pathways, so to speak. So if it's not just about external solutions, then where do we even begin? What does Dr. K suggest? Well, he believes that overcoming dysthymia is less about finding quick fixes and more about fundamentally changing how we experience pleasure. So sh shifting that focus from external to internal, as we were talking about earlier. Exactly. And he lays out a few steps to get started. And honestly, they're not always easy. Oh, like what? Well, he says the first step is to start recognizing the guilt. The gu yeah, like notice how often you approach pleasurable activities with a sense of obligation or shoulds, you know, that inner voice that says, I should be working instead of relaxing or I don't deserve to enjoy this. Oh, I know that voice all too well. It's like a constant buzzkill. Right. And the key is to start identifying and challenging those thought patterns because they're often rooted in that, you know, that old programming that tells us our worth is conditional. So it's about catching ourselves in those moments and reframing the way we think about pleasure and enjoyment. Exactly. And then he suggests something pretty interesting. He calls it engaging with the discomfort. Engaging with the discomfort. Sounds intense. It can be. It's basically the idea of intentionally doing things that trigger those feelings of guilt or unworthiness and just sitting with the discomfort, you know, noticing what comes up without judgment. So it's like facing your fears head on instead of trying to avoid them. Yes. Because what you often find is that the fear itself is way scarier than the actual experience. That the monster under the bed is way less intimidating once you turn on the lights. Exactly. And then finally, Dr. K talks about the importance of embracing independence. Independence, you mean like in the traditional sense? Well, yes and no. It's more about reclaiming your right to make choices that bring you joy, regardless of what others might think or whether it earns their validation. So like picking up a paintbrush, even if you're afraid of what people might think of your art or taking that trip, even if you're worried about judgment. Exactly. It's about giving ourselves permission to explore what brings us joy without needing anyone else's approval. And that, you know, that can be a really radical act, especially for someone who's used to prioritizing everyone else's needs above their own. It's like unlearning a lifetime of conditioning. Exactly. And, you know, as with any kind of unlearning, it can be a bit messy, right? Messy in what way? What kind of bumps in the road are we talking about here? Well, Dr. K warns about the possibility of like pushback from people who are used to you, I don't know, maybe putting their needs first. Like they've gotten so used to you being a certain way, always accommodating, always people pleasing, that when you start setting boundaries, it kind of rocks the boat. Yeah, it's like they've become, I don't know, maybe a little too comfortable with that old dynamic and any shift, even a positive one can be, I don't know, a little bit jarring. So it's almost like a bittersweet side effect of growth. Yeah. You know, as you step into a more authentic version of yourself, you might have to leave some of those old dynamics behind. It definitely takes courage, not going to lie, and a lot of resilience. But Dr. K is really adamant that it's worth it, you know, that this process, as challenging as it can be, ultimately leads to a more solid foundation for happiness. 
Yeah, it's like you were saying earlier about the house, right? Mm -hmm. If you build your happiness on external validation, it's like building on sand. But when you start to cultivate that internal sense of worth, that's your bedrock. I love that analogy. And, you know, Dr. K actually leaves us with this really powerful image. He compares overcoming dysthymia to building a complex piece of furniture. A building furniture. Yeah, he's saying that you can't just force the final product, you know. You have to be patient. You have to focus on putting each individual piece together carefully. So it's about finding the satisfaction in the process, not just fixating on the end goal. Exactly. It's about rewiring that internal reward system, rediscovering that sense of joy and accomplishment that comes from building something meaningful from the inside out. So for anyone listening who's resonated with this conversation about dysthymia, who's maybe feeling seen for the first time, Remember this. Yeah. Your happiness is not something you need to apologize for. It's not selfish to prioritize your own well-being. In fact, it's essential. And while reclaiming that happiness, you know, breaking free from those old patterns, it can be tough. It's a journey worth taking. Absolutely. And as always, be kind to yourself along the way. You know, there's no such thing as perfect happiness. It's an ongoing process of growth and self-discovery. It's about progress, not perfection. Yeah. Sometimes it's about embracing the messy, imperfect beauty of being human.